Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, Mrs. Rajavi, uh, platform colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here today with such distinguished colleagues from both sides of the Atlantic. I want, first of all, to extend a special thank you to you, Madam Rajavi, for leading these international efforts and for managing to bring together so many diverse political views under one roof and behind the same cause. Those of us who have spent the greater part of our lives in politics know that this is an enormous task and I'm very proud. I'm very proud to be part of your great international movement for peace and justice for the people of Iran. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by expressing my concern and that of many of my colleagues in both houses of the British Parliament about recent developments in Iraq. Today, I'm expressing uh, the views and representing the uh, British Parliamentary Committee for Iran Freedom that has more than 120 active members in both houses at Westminster and which enjoys the support of over 500 members of parliament and peers. Just as I came in here today, I got a message from one of our senior clergy, one of our very senior clergy, the Right Reverend John Pritchard, who's the Bishop of Oxford. And um, he was expressing not only his views, he said, I have recently added my voice to that of the Archbishop of, Archbishops of Wales and of Ireland and many other bishops from across Britain to warn Mr. Antoni O. Guterres, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, not to fall prey to this trap laid down by the regimes of Iran and Iraq. And I, I the Archbishop, the Primate of all Ireland, is my personal friend and spiritual leader. And I can tell you, I've talked to him, and he is 100% behind you here today. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to delay, but uh, I'll just read you one more sentence from the message from the Bishop of Oxford, and he said, I call on the United States government and Secretary Clinton in particular to remove the last optical obstacle to settling the residents of Ashraf in third countries. It is high time that Washington District Court ruling of July 2010 was implemented and the PMOI must be removed from the FTO list. With all of you, ladies and gentlemen, my colleagues and I are angry that as soon as we put behind a dangerous episode regarding the arbitrary deadline for the closure of Camp Ashraf, we've been confronted with yet another dangerous provocation. It seems that Maliki is determined not to recognize nor to leave any of the rights of the residents of Camp Ashraf unbreached. Even when the residents of Ashraf were supposed to move to another camp, which was the US Army base, he has tried to turn it into a prisoner, as somebody more correctly said, a concentration camp, by putting restrictions that have no justification. He is not responding to any reasonable international expectation in respect of the residents, but puts in place every obstacle he can. Even though in the modest and some of us would say overall inadequate mem memorandum of understanding, 
it has been indicated that all the residents of Ashram, uh, Ashraf should safely be moved to Camp Liberty. And I didn't know until today that that was indeed intended to be a concentration camp. I I'm, I'm, was interested in what I heard about the, the ridiculous size of it. Um, even though uh, the, 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 uh, we've had this uh, memorandum of understanding, Nuri al-Maliki just last week in an interview with Iranian regime media repeated false uh, the false accusations of the Iranian mullahs uh, and said that he has arrest warrants for over 120. I have 126 of the residents. This means that the Iranian regime demands of him to arrest, in effect, the leadership of the camp. And he is willingly capitulating and ready to meet this spurious demand. There is only one reason for this. He sees the determination of the residents of Camp Ashraf as the most serious opposition to the oppressive regime that is the Iranian mullahs. And of course, he is now depending on the Iranian mullahs to sustain his own very dubious uh, presidency in Iraq. Maliki is radiating new signal, signals each day to show us that he does not have the will to, do, to stand against the demands of the mullahs ruling Iran. And he cannot, I suppose he dare not, um, uh, ameliorate his animosity towards the residents of Camp Ashraf for that reason. Today, we know that any memorandum of understanding that he puts his hand to with the international community about Ashraf, he then has to prove to the mullahs. By his perverse actions, he has shown that his signature is never intended as something, as a substantive expression of goodwill or a commitment to do what is honorable. The international community must now draw its own conclusions. There has to be, uh, there has been, so far, from the international community, too much equivocation. It will not obtain a positive result with Maliki to resolve the Ashraf crisis unless the United Nations sends them a clear message and they must act now, decisively. Only if the United Nations from this platform today can pick up that message and meet its obligations will uh, we have any hope that the people of Camp Ashraf will not suffer a great deal more than they have to date. <laughs> let, let me concentrate on that point. Today we need and expect the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to tell, and in unequivocal terms, Nouri al-Maliki that he cannot use the pretext of Iraqi sovereignty to bully us, that he cannot imprison 3,400 defenseless asylum seekers, that the United Nations uh, Human Rights Commission, Commission for Human Rights, has recognized those rights associated with the clearly declared status of Camp Ashraf residents. Nuri al-Maliki has no justification for trampling on their rights, for preventing them from taking their legal assets, or for carrying out illegal action against them 
in the name of Iraqi sovereignty. It is Nuri al-Maliki, not the residents of Camp Ashraf or the presence of the residents of Camp Ashraf who demeans that sovereignty by his, Nuri al-Maliki's, duplicity. So, if I read what my colleagues have said here today, we need, we demand that the High Commissioner tell al-Maliki that the United Nations cannot tolerate any deliberate delays in carrying out the UNCHR process. Until Camp Liberty is ready and adequate, the UNCHR must insist on their um, uh, international obligations to uh, bring part of Camp Ashraf under its control and start interviewing the residents to be sent to third, to, to third countries. This assurance we expect to hear from the High Commissioner, not next week, not tomorrow, but right now, today. <laughs> I'll conclude by saying this. As a member of the British Parliament and as a Br member of the British Committee for Ar Iran Freedom, I assure you that we demand our government accepts some of those refugees and opens the door especially to sick patients. This is what the United Nations Secretary General has demanded from all UN member states. We think that all governments, and first and foremost, my government should do that. I, I, look, I look for my... U US, United States colleagues on the platform to bend Mrs. Clinton's ear so that she does listen and so that she takes appropriate, I was going to say timely, it's now untimely, but at, let's, at least let her take action now. Ladies and gentlemen, to that end, I promise that the British Parliamentary Committee for Iranian Freedom is fully dedicated and committed. And one other thing, David Phillips, you volunteered, General, to go to Camp Ashraf. If you can persuade Mrs. Clinton and you want to internationalise it, I'll come with you. Thank you.